We're in church this morning. It's going to be a good morning. I'm excited to see you guys. How are you doing this morning? Are you looking good? You feeling good? Look at somebody and tell them they're looking good. Even if it's not true, it's okay. I'm, I'm giving you permission, right? Just tell them they look good. Tell them that I'm trying to help some of you fellas out with your wife. But today is such an incredible day, and I'm so excited to be with you. We, we were gone last Sunday. We missed you guys. Uh, my name is Pastor Alex, or my name is not Pastor Alex. My name's Alex. I am a pastor. Uh, but uh, I, I just so incredible to be back, and, and I'm excited about today because we're continuing our legacy series. How many of you have enjoyed this legacy series? We, God has been speaking to us about leaving a legacy. We've been talking about the difference between heritage and legacy. We've been talking about uh, heritage is about the past, but a legacy is about the future. And, and so what we want to talk about is, is leaving a legacy. And I'm so excited about what God is doing in the life of our church. And look around you. This service is packed. Our church is growing. God is doing incredible things. Yeah, you can celebrate that. Uh, just a little just a little shout out. We do have two other services. So if you want a little bit more room, there's room in the nine o'clock service or in the t- or the 12 o'clock service. We'd love to have you in those services. But I'm excited because we're talking about legacy today. And, and I believe that we have a heritage. We've been talking about heritage and how heritage is about the past. But we kind of been talking about a little bit like it's a bad thing. But I celebrate our heritage, because many of us are in this place today because of our heritage. You're here today because maybe you were raised in a Christian home, or you're, we're here in this country today because of the heritage that people that fought for our freedom to actually gather together and and have a religious service and lift our hands and sing songs. Not everybody gets to do that. So we have an incredible heritage. We're actually in this building. And if you can't tell, I'm going to be hyped today. So I need you to match my hype. Like, you, you can't get you can't get hyped in worship and then chill during the preaching. It's just I, I, I feel I feel like you don't like me when you do that. So 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 we have an incredible heritage. Even in this building, we have a heritage that we're able to gather today. And people have been baptized and hundreds of people have been saved because in the 1950s, the Church of Christ of Round Rock sacrificed and they built this structure that even though they're no longer the ones in this building, they've left a heritage. They have left a legacy that people are still being impacted today because of their sacrifice. And so we have a heritage. But my question for you today is, what is our legacy going to be? See, see, we're celebrating the heritage of those who have gone before us and we're enjoying it. We're loving it. We're, we're getting to bask in all of it. And I love, you know, I love America. I love that we get to do this. I love this church. I love all these sacrifices. I'm enjoying it. But, but are we planting for the next generation? Are, are we just enjoying what's been given to us? Or are we getting ready to prepare for the next generation that's going to come behind us? I was thinking about this while we were on our trip last weekend. We were in uh, Sydney, Australia for some friend's wedding. And they had this beautiful wedding. And it was in the Sydney Harbor, which is just this iconic place. If you've seen a movie or whatever, you've probably seen this before. And there was this giant fig tree. I think we have a picture of it. And they got married in front of this fig tree. I didn't even know fig trees could get this big, guys. Like, this is a big tree. And it's kind of small. I know these screens aren't super big. But if you can imagine, I'm a pretty large guy. And it would take about six of me standing shoulder to shoulder just to cover one side of this tree. And so as I was looking at this tree, I I began to think, because I'm kind of a history nerd. I like to look at things. And so I began to think of, of how long that tree had been there. The things that that tree had seen. The things that that tree had experienced because the hill that that marriage was celebrated on right in front of this tree. At one time, it was a colonial fort. Then it was an observatory. Now it's a park where people just have fun and play Frisbee and get married and all kinds of crazy stuff. But what had that what had that tree seen? And I started to think about what if that tree wasn't there? That see, a lot of times we want to enjoy something, but we want to enjoy it now. And we're not prepared to do the work to enjoy it in the future. Have you ever heard the saying that the best time to plant a tree was 40 years ago? That a lot of times we're wanting the shade of a tree, but we have to wait and we have to operate and we have to plant and we have to watch it grow. It doesn't just happen in an instant. It's not a microwave. It doesn't just happen. So I begin to think, well, how did these trees, how were they planted? Well, I looked back in the 1850s. A group of people in Sydney, Australia decided, hey, one day this will be a really nice park and people will want to enjoy this. So we need to do some things today. We need to get a committee together. We need to raise some money. We need to collect some tax. This is history. I'm not preaching right now. This is history. We need to collect some things and we need to plant some things in the ground so that future generations can can enjoy what we're doing right now. 
That's just a history lesson. I'm not even preaching yet. So they planted some things now. So, so what are we planting? What are we, what are, how are we plowing the ground? How are we breaking up the rock and breaking up the soil and planting some things so we may not get to enjoy them? The people that planted that tree, they didn't get to enjoy it. But they said, I'll give up. I'll sacrifice. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll give of myself so that other people can enjoy this. So are we planting for the next generation? We have to leave a legacy. It takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice of your time. It takes sacrifice of what you want to do. Maybe you want to do some other things with your life. Maybe you want to do some other things with your weekend. Maybe you want to do some other things with your skills, but, but it takes sacrifice to impact other people. It can't just be all about us. If we really want to impact other people, it's always going to be a sacrifice for us. I, I, I'm sure that a lot of the people that went to the, go under the homeless, uh, to, to feed the homeless yesterday underneath the bridge, they didn't really get anything physically out of that. It's not like they're getting paid to be down there. It's not like they're getting a gold star, but they're going down there because they're saying, hey, I'm going to sacrifice of the plenty that I have to help these other people. I'm going to sow some things in these people's life. I'm going to tell them that they're loved. I'm going to tell them that they're beautiful. I'm going to sow some things in their life that maybe will change them. So it takes sacrifice from us. And what I want to talk to you about today, and I don't want you to get too tight, but what I want to talk to you about today is it takes sacrifice in our giving. It takes sacrifice, it takes giving of our finances to make an impact. And I know some of you just went, whoop, you just, you just, you just tightened up. You just, oh, you looked at your, you said, I, know, I knew I didn't want to come to church today. I, that's all churches are about. But I can tell you this, I can tell you this. This is the first time in over two years that we've ever talked a, a full sermon about finances. And this is what I want you, just to break the ice, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to tell him God doesn't need your money. Oh, come on, look at somebody else. Tell, tell them like you believe it. God doesn't need your money. But now I want you to turn around and say to that same person, but you need God's blessing. See, God doesn't need our money. God promised us he's going to build his church. He's going to build the kingdom. Souls are going to be saved. Things are going to happen, but we need his blessing. Because here's the deal. If we are hoarding everything up for ourselves, that's not building a legacy. That's building a dynasty. And see, a dynasty is about all that I can get. A legacy is about how much can I give to other people. It's not about how can I make my life great and build monuments for myself. It's about how can I build monuments that 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now will still be impacting people. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22 says this, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So not only are you leaving an inheritance, a legacy just for one generation, but this is generational. Why do you think, we, I, I love economics, I love business. And why do you think there are certain families that are so wealthy in the world we live in today? It's not because of a one-time thing. It's not because of a one-time one accident. It's because generationally, they have built a legacy and built a legacy and poured into the next generation. Here are the tools you need. Here are the resources you need because we want you to go farther than us. We don't want you to have to start from the ground up. I, I hate this mentality of, well, I started from the bottom. My kids are going to start from the bottom. And then they're going to start. No, no, no. I want my kids to go so much farther, so much higher. I want them to be so much more educated than me. I want them to be so much go better looking than me. I want them to be better than me. Because I want to leave a legacy for my children's children. So today I want to talk to you about giving. And I, and I hope you don't get too tight. But I, I want you to really believe this. That God wants to bless your life. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. I know this is kind of an interesting verse to talk about giving. But I think God is going to speak to us today. He spoke to us in the first service. God is beginning to move. Matthew chapter 14 says this. And when Jesus went out. He saw a great multitude. So just to back this up for you if, you, if you don't know much about the Bible, Jesus is trying to get away from people. He's trying to go be alone. Like, I think Jesus may have been a little bit of an introvert because he would be with people, but he's like, I got to go take a nap. Like, I got to go. Y'all crazy. Like, I'm not staying up till 1.30 at the young adults thing. I'm leaving at 8 o'clock. Love y'all. I'm going home. Like, it's, so, so Jesus is trying to get away from people, but everywhere Jesus goes, people show up. All throughout the Gospels, no matter how far out in the wilderness he gets, people show up. 
So he's in the middle of a deserted place and a multitude of people. We read later on about 5,000 men, which it didn't record the women and the children, but we can guesstimate between 10 and 20,000 people showed up to hear Jesus. And he was moved with compassion for them. He didn't tell them to go home. He was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. Next verse. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Hey, Jesus, it's getting late. Uh, IHOP is about to close. We got to get these people out of here. Like they got to get to the buffet before everybody else gets there. Like we got to do something. Send the multitudes away. Send the multitudes away that they may go to the village and buy food for themselves. Okay, just, just a little station break. Can you imagine being the guy that got elected to tell Jesus he was preaching too long? Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but preachers don't like when you tell them they're preaching too long because they're like, this is good. You need to listen to this. This is good stuff. So can you just be in the guy? And I, I, I imagine the disciples were probably like, John, you go talk to him. He says he loves you the best. Like, y'all are boys. He'll listen to you. He won't get mad at you. How many of you, when you were kids, you always sent the favorite child to ask your parents something? They love you the most. They'll say yes to you. Like, they'll, they'll, you ask them if we go to Chuck E. Cheese. I can't ask them. So they send the disciple. And I can imagine, you know, him just, you know, hey, G- hey, Jesus. Hey, you know, uh, hey, hey, Jesus. Awesome sermon. Great, you know, you're healing people. I know, you know, gr- people are being saved. It's gr- great, but uh, it's, get, it's getting a little late. And I, th- I think we need to send them to go. A great sermon. I'm not saying anything about the sermon, you know, but we need to send them to go eat. I think, they, I think they need to go get some food. So Jesus says, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I'm going to keep preaching. You figure it out. He said, if you think they need something to eat, you do it. Don't ask me. You take care of it. Could it be that in your life you are asking God to take care of some things and he's turning around and saying, why don't you do it? You're saying, God, I wish somebody would help the homeless. God, I wish somebody would help the the teenagers that are on drugs. God, I wish somebody would mentor these kids. God, I wish. And God is saying, you are somebody. You are somebody. What if your frustration is actually actually an activation? Y'all got it over here. I don't think y'all got it over here. What if your frustration is actually an activation? What what if the thing that bothers you the most, God is saying, I've actually put that in you and I, I made that bother you because I want you to pay attention to it. Nobody else notices it except you, John, except you, Roxanne. Nobody else cares about it, but that doesn't matter. I need you to care about it. I need you to have a burden for it because I put it on your life. It's an activation. God's saying, I need you to do it. I need you to take care of it. The thing that frustrates you the most is the thing that you're called to fix. If you stick around long here at Oasis Church, if you come to us with a problem, I'm probably going to be like, Jesus, great, fix it. You do it. Like, like if you don't like something, great, fix it. Like, I don't want to figure it out. You fix it. But, but not just in the church, but there are things in your life. There are ministries. There are people. There's that person that you just see them. And every time you just, you're like, why do I think about them so much? Why does it bother me so much, the lifestyle that they're living? Why, why do I feel like I should help them? They're, they're better off than me. Why do I feel like I should help them? God maybe is calling you to do it. There are things that only you can speak to. We kind of talked about it a little bit in church news, but next week we're having nine preachers over our three services. It's going to be, it's going to be so cool. I know some of you are not getting excited because you're like three preachers. We're going to be here all day. Like how they only going to preach for like seven minutes. It's okay. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. But the, the reason we told them we had a training yesterday and we said, one of the main reasons we want to do this, not just to develop them as speakers, But we believe that there are things that only they can speak to. There are experiences, there's backgrounds, there's there's environments that they grew up in that I didn't grow up in those environments. I didn't grow up in that community. I didn't grow up with those restrictions. And so I can speak to it, but maybe it's not as impactful as if they speak to it. And so some of you, you have things in your life that you hate so much and it seems like a problem in your life. But God is saying that's actually a tool that I want you to use to speak to people who have actually gone through that same thing. 
So there are things you can only speak to. So, so going back, so, so Jesus says, you do it. And so like, got you, Jesus. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Rick. Great. Perfect. Hey, guys, so he told us to do it. Uh, I don't really know. And then, did, did you tell him, John? Like, you told him we were in the des- deserted place. You told him there was no Chick-fil-A around here, and it's Sunday, so it's closed anyway. So you told him there was. So And he's they're like, I, I told him, man. I told I, He's not listening. You know, he's Jesus. Like, he's up there preaching. Like, he don't have time for us. And, and so so they're like, okay, well, maybe we'll just find something around here. So they, they go around, and another translation, not in Matthew, tells us that they found a little boy who had a little lunchbox. And he had a, a few little things in there, so they, they, kind of, they said, that's ours now. We, we are acquiring it. We're commandeering this. This is for the good of the ministry right here. Taking it. You, you can just imagine this little boy like, oh, thanks. A grown man just took my lunchbox from me. Like, I thought you were a preacher, you know, taking stuff from me. So they take this, and they bring it to Jesus, and this is what they say. We have only five loaves and two fish. Jesus, I know you're telling us to do this, but there is no way because, look, we only have this. And what they are doing is they're trying to prove to Jesus that they don't have the resources to do what he has called them to do. They are trying to show Jesus, Jesus, I know you're God. I know you got all these plans. I know you've been training us, but but look, count it for yourself. We only have five loaves and two fish. And even if it was 500 loaves and 200 fish, it still wouldn't have been enough for 15,000 people. This is all we have. They were proving they didn't have enough. But again, just imagine Jesus just preaching and they're just bugging him. He's just like, y'all better stop bugging me. And so I can imagine him just stopping his sermon And turning around and saying, hey, you don't have enough, but I think you forgot I am more than enough. I am Jehovah Jireh, your provider. I don't think you realize that I created all of this. I spoke the world into existence. Yeah, that fish that's dead right now. Yeah, I spoke that into existence. See, I've been around a lot longer than you've been around. And so I just want to let you know that you don't think you have enough, but I got this. Like, I I got this. All right, Jesus. Cool. Well, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, this is all we have. Let's let's give it to you. And so they give what they have to Jesus. And this is what Jesus does. Doesn't tell them the plan. Doesn't explain it. He just turns around and he commands the multitude sit down on the grass. So they're like, did, does he have a food truck coming in? Like, what's the plan, Jesus? Like, what you about to, what you about to do? You know what? what what's about to ha- sit down? Uh, translation tells groups of 50, you know, all this kind of stuff. And and so he takes, and I want you to highlight this, verse 19, circle it, whatever you got to do. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. Man, that was, wow, Jesus, you prayed for the bread. Awesome. Like, wow. You know how, like, in your family, you get the most spiritual person to pray for, like, the meal? You're like, awesome, that's great, but now we still have five loaves and two fish. We're still in the same predicament that we were in before. We're still in the same situation. Like, I know you're Jesus, and I know you can do anything, but I think you missed a step, Jesus. Like, I I think you were supposed to bless it, break it, and then I think it was supposed to multiply, and then you give it to us. Can, can you just rewind that real quick? Jesus, just, just bless it. Oh, multiply. Manna fall from heaven. Like all these food trucks are going to pull up. Like Jason's Deli catering boxes are just going to be starting passed out. Like I, I think you missed a step, Jesus. But Jesus gave it back to them. So there's a couple things I want to pull out from this. And I think it's a principle that we can apply to our life. The first one is they brought what they had. They brought what they had. Now, it wasn't enough. And it wasn't even what Jesus asked for. He told them to feed the 5,000. They just brought him this little offering. It wasn't enough, but it was what they had. And they said, I know if anything is going to happen today, I know we have to bring at least what we have to do. I know it's not enough. I know it's not good enough, but I've got to bring at least what I have. And I think there are so many of us that we don't give what we have to God because we feel like it's not enough. And it's like, well, if this is all I can give, if I can only give this much time, if I can only give this much of my finance, if I can only give, it's not even worth it. This is an insult to God to give this much. 
Like he asked me to feed 5,000 people and I can just give him this. Like this is ridiculous. But what do you have? What can you give to God? Maybe it's a few dollars. Maybe it's an hour a week. Maybe it's showing up at 815 on Sunday mornings to serve on Sunday mornings. What do you have that you can give to God? Maybe seeming insignificant, but believing when I give it to God, something's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to provide it. I don't know how he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way, but I know he's going to make a way. I know it's going to happen. So they gave it to him. The second part is Jesus blessed it. They did things God's way. God will only bless things that are done his way. And many of us, not just in our finances, but there are things that we are doing that maybe is a good thing, but it's not a God thing. It's not God's way. And so we are wanting a blessing. We are wanting a breakthrough. We're wanting something to have in our life. And God said, I can't do it because you're not doing it God's way. I can't bless what you're not doing in the natural order of the Bible. I can't do what I can't bless this. Many of you have relationships that you're in right now that can't be blessed. You have job situations that you haven't given to God and can't be blessed. And so you're struggling, wondering why nothing's happening. And God is saying, I haven't blessed it yet. So you can do the right thing the wrong way. I don't believe that the miracle would have happened if they would have tried it on their own. Just a newsflash. If you don't know the story, a miracle is going to happen in a few minutes. What if I just got to the end of the sermon and I was like, they ate the five loaves. That was it. Go home. Like, how disappointing would that be? But I, I don't believe that if they would have tried to do it on their own, if Peter or John or one of the other disciples, if they would have taken the bread and, okay, we're going to bless it. Now we're going to break it. I don't believe that the miracle would have happened. But how often do we try to skip God's order? We try to skip God's plan for our lives. I know what God's going to say anyway, so I'm going to just do it. I, I know what God, I know, I know, I know what's going to happen anyway, so I'm just going to skip ahead. And God's saying, no, I need you to bring me what you have, and then I need to bless it. And then the third part, he broke it and gave it back. Nothing happened. Thanks, thanks, Jesus. But well, we still got to feed these people. Like what, like what happened? And not only... Did he just give it back to them? But actually they had less now than they started with. When they gave it to God, they said, God, I thought you were going to multiply and you divided it. Now you took five loaves and divided it among 12 disciples. But how does this work out? They had less than they started with before. All they had was a crumb. They had a little piece and like, okay, do I eat this or do I give it to other people? Am I going to? Build a dynasty for myself or I'm going to build a legacy for other people? What am I going to do with this little piece that I have? Because it's not enough to fulfill my needs. It's not enough to fulfill the needs of other people around me. It's not enough to even fulfill our posse's needs, our group's needs. Like we are, the green room is empty, Jesus. Like they did not stock the green room at this conference. Like this is not what is happening right now. But let me tell you this. They had less, but it was blessed. They had less than they started with, but it was blessed. And let me tell you this right now, that if you have less, but God has blessed it, it will always go farther than it will on your own. If they would have taken that bread and tried to multiply it themselves, it would have gone nowhere. But God said, because you've done it my way, even though it's less, it's going to accomplish the purpose. Even though it's less, you're going to find breakthrough. Even though it's less, you're going to be able to pay your bills. Even though it's less, you're going to be able to do it. He gave back less. So they started to operate on less than they had before. Think about that for a moment. How often have we told ourselves that if I give that to God, I won't be able to operate because I can barely even operate it as it is right now. They couldn't accomplish the goal already. I need you to get that. They couldn't feed the people already. So if they couldn't do it already, why don't you just take a chance at doing it God's way? If you already don't know what you're doing with your life, why don't you just take a chance and try God? Like if you don't know what you believe, why don't you just take a shot and try Jesus? Just see what happens. 
So it was less, but it was blessed. The next part of that verse, and I love there there should really be there should really be an extra verse right here. Because it, it really confuses me that he broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. I'm a little confused. Okay, so going back, I'm, I'm not great at math, guys. So going back five loaves, two fish. So he broke it, and now they gave it to the multitudes. See, what I, what I think we don't realize is, is what happened is it didn't multiply in Jesus' hand. See, I think the disciples, they were expecting it to multiply in Jesus' hand. And Jesus be like, okay, a loaf for you, a loaf for you, a loaf for you, a, lo- a fish for you, a fish for We're all getting fit. You know, anybody know? You, you don't, you, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all too saved. You just watch TBN all the time. So I think they expected Jesus to start throwing out. And Jesus said, no, actually, I'm going to give you a crumb and I need you to feed these people. Remember, I need you to take care of it. I'm trying to preach. I need you to take care of it. So, see, me, if I was a disciple, I'd be like, okay, so if we break this up in microscopic crumbs, like, I'm going to give every, I'd be like, here's your piece. Here's your piece. You better not take seconds. Here's here's your piece. And then you got that one kid's like, I want some more. You're not getting any more. You better take that. You better be happy with it. Anybody ever have a parent like that where they, well, you better, you better stop it. You better, I'm going to talk to you after I get home. But so I can imagine this is what the disciples are planning. And, and they, they start to pass it out. And they're like, you get a crumb. You get a crumb. You get a crumb. And they get to the last little piece. And I can just imagine the disciples as they're, and they just see this sea of people. Maybe they fed three or four people and those people are like, oh, great. We got a little snack. But they see this, imagine, okay, imagine, guys, 15,000 people. This was not a stadium. This was sitting on the ground. 15,000, a multitude of people. And I can imagine them getting and getting to the last piece and looking back at Jesus and I told you, Jesus, I told you we have five loaves. I, t- I know, I, I try to tell him too, he don't listen to us. I don't know, he thinks he's God or something. I don't know what it, Listen, listen. So they get to the last piece. And I can imagine them handing the last piece and saying, all right, guys, that's all. We're, we're so sorry. We don't have, we don't have any more food. Um, okay, one more, one more person, one more person. All right, that's it. That's it. That's all the food. Okay, one more person. One more person, one more person, one more person, one more person, one more person. And they feed all 5,000, 6,000, 20,000 people. And they're wondering, how did that all come out of what was in my hands? How did that all come out of the little bit that I had in my hand? The little bit that I decided to give to God. The little bit that wasn't enough. It wasn't worthy. It wasn't good enough. But I gave it to God. And look what it did now. So they gave it to God, and as our worship team is coming up right now, they begin to give it out, give it out, give it out. But at the end, something happens. Because, see, they didn't have any food, and then they borrowed some food from a little kid, and then they've given all their food out to other people. And at the end, I can imagine, man, Jesus, that's an awesome miracle. That's so, man, I'm so hyped up. Look what God did. I knew you were going to do it, Jesus. I doubted you for a second, but I knew you were going to do it. I, they, all these guys, they're haters, but I really believed in you, Jesus. Like, I'm the, I'm the true disciple. Like, you know, they were doubting you, but I never doubted you, Jesus. I'm, I never doubted you. And it's like, yeah, sure. But Jesus like, hey, hey, I, I, think you, I think you missed something. Not only did you have enough to feed this group of people, but I want to make sure that you're taken care of. So after all of these people were filled, not a little snack, these people were filling themselves. This was like buffet style. After they were all filled, they took up 12 baskets full of, Of the fragments that remained. The fragments that remained. The little bit that remained. 
What they started out with wasn't even enough to fill up one basket. Now the remains, the crumbs, the leftovers are filling 12 baskets. And I think it's no coincidence that there were 12 baskets and there were 12 disciples. And Jesus is saying, I'm trying to teach you a principle. I'm trying to teach you the principle that if you will bring to me what you have, if you will let me bless it, And then if you will use it to do what I have called you to do, you will always have more than enough. You will be filled to overflowing. It's not just going to be like, okay, I'm full. No, no, we're taking home plates. Like I'm taking home plates. Anybody like this is not just I'm okay. This is God is saying I'm giving you more than enough. I know it's less than you thought you started with. But now you have overflowing and abundance. If you do things God's way. Somebody say God's way. If you leave a legacy. You always have more than enough. You will fulfill your purpose. And still have plenty left over for yourself. Still have plenty left over for your family. But see we're so scared of doing it God's way. Because we want to just try to make it on the little bit that we have. And whatever that may be for you. We have people that are on all different economic levels. But we have this thing where it's like, I just want to keep what I have. And I'm going to try to make this work. I'm going to divide it up a little bit by a little bit. I'm going to pass out the crumbs as I need to. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make it get by. But but God is saying, if you would just trust me. If you would just trust me, it's going to be better than you could ever ask or imagine. Let's stand together right now. See, so many are worried that if you give it all to God, you won't have any left over for yourself. I know I've wondered that before. I, I need, to, I can't give this 10% to God. I can't, I can't tie this. I can't give an offering above my tithe because I need this like to pay my bills. Like this in for some new shoes. This is like real life. But God is saying, I know that's what you think in your natural mind. But if you would just trust me. Isn't it interesting how we will trust Jesus with our salvation but not our money? That's just a little, just throwing that out there. We'll trust him that he'll take us to heaven, but we might not trust him with our little paycheck every week. And I know I'm talking about money and I know you're probably here and you're like, I don't want to talk about money in church. Again, it's not about money. It's about the principle. It's about you being blessed. It's about every area of your life. That there are areas of your life, maybe not just money, but that you can take this and you're saying, okay, in this area of my life, I don't have a legacy mentality. I have a dynasty mentality. And in this area of my life, I'm trying to hoard up everything for myself instead of passing it and saying, okay, God, I'm going to give it to you. Bless it. This is how my family's really operated our whole life. It used to bother me when I was so bad. I thought of this story in between services, talking about legacy, about sacrifice, of things where it's not about what I can get, it's about how much can I give? How much can I leave? We had a 1950s Suburban, and I loved it. I was like, this is gonna be my car. It's candy apple red, white leather interior. I was like, I was like six, and I was like, I'm gonna drive this one day. And my parents decided to sell it and they gave the money to missionaries that were going to Lithuania. This is like what, like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago at least. Because it was about, it's not about, I don't need this extra car. I I don't need this fancy object. I need to leave a legacy. And there are people that are going to Lithuania to reach people for Jesus and they need some money. Like it costs money for a plane ticket. You can pray all you want. You got to pay money for a plane ticket. Like you got to pay money for a visa. But they're going to go to reach people. And can I tell you today that today that same couple is having services in Lithuania, reaching hundreds of young people in Lithuania, a completely secular nation. They, They actually teach at the university. The pastor's wife teaches a choir at the university. You know what songs they sing for choir? gospel songs because there ain't no choir songs but gospel songs so they're in there worshiping at a secular university because somebody said i don't need this for myself 
I'm going to leave a legacy to impact other people. So it's all about legacy. And just to get very practical with you, we're going to take up a legacy offering on December 9th. We're not going to pressure you right now. I know that's how a lot of churches are. That's not our culture. I'm not going to get you all hyped up and say, okay, we're about to pass the offering plates. But on December 9th, at all of our Sunday services, and online as well, person, I really would suggest that you bring it in person. Even if you have to go get a check. I don't even have a check. But bring it in person so that, so that you understand the weight of it. But we are asking that everyone praise to God. What would he have you give? Not what we're going to tell you to give. We're not going to say, okay, who can give 500? Raise your hand. Who can give 1,000? Raise your hand. Who can give 20? Raise your hand. No, no. We're going to have you ask God and bring a legacy offering on December 9th. Because there are things that we want to leave a legacy in this city. We want to reach more people in this city. We want to see more people get set free from addiction and bondage. And we're seeing about chains falling and, and chain. Hey, hey, chains falling, that's great to sing about, but we really need to fund an addiction recovery program. Like, like, like serving the homeless is great, but we really need to build a halfway house where we can actually tra train and equip them. And so it's great to sing about it, but we got we to gotta do it. Jesus is saying, you're, you're talking about it. You're saying there's a need, you do it. Oasis Church, guests, visitors, I need you to do it. I don't need you to say, oh, we need to help those that are in the sex trafficking program. No, no, no. You need to get wealth. You need to educate yourself. You need to build wealth, not so that you can hoard it, but so that you can build a training program and rescue them out of that. There's a pastor from Church of the Highlands in Alabama, one of the largest churches in America. And he is a extremely wealthy businessman. Extremely wealthy. He runs an operation where they rescue women out of the sex trafficking industry. And they put them in this home on a ranch. They don't pay for anything. The government doesn't pay for it. He pays for it. Because God has given him wealth, not for himself, but to, to pass out to other people. And then, listen to this, and then they make the women pay rent and pay tithe off of their little income that they get from the program because it's God's way. And then at the end of the program, they don't know this, but at the end of the program, they give them that lump sum back to start their new life because it's God's way. It's God's way of doing things. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray for you today. And if you're in this place, I know we've been talking about finances, but we always talk about Jesus. And Jesus wants you to do things his way.